But tonight we're in chapter 22 here in the Gospel of Luke. Let's read verses 63 through 65, and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 22, verses 63 through 65. Then I'm going to cross-reference out of Mark chapter 14 and develop this study with you. But here in Luke chapter 22 at verse 63, it says, The men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him, and having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. And so Jesus is going through what would be called a preliminary interrogation. He's been handed over to a group of guards, and we obviously see just by reading this that they are mocking him and they are abusing him. Uh, when they say prophesy there in verse 64, who is the one who struck you? It's obvious that they had heard of his reputation as a prophet. And so as they are mocking him, they're throwing into his face the words that they have heard concerning him. This reminds me of Isaiah. As a matter of fact, this is a fulfillment of a prophecy that you find in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. You know, sometimes when I'm sharing with you, I am assuming everybody here in this room knows that Isaiah was written some 750 years before Christ. And in the book of Isaiah, over seven centuries before Jesus is here on earth, the prophet Isaiah had been moved by the Spirit of God to record scriptures that related to the Jewish Messiah. And Jesus fulfilled many of the words that God had inspired Isaiah to write. Isaiah wrote in chapter 50, verses 6 and 7, in reference to prophetically Messiah, I gave my back the, to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. So Jesus is being mocked. He's being taunted. He's being abused. Even as Isaiah had prophesied over seven centuries before. And so what is taking place is Jesus is there going through the mockery of a trial. It says in verse 66, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him to the council. What we're seeing is actually a second phase, and what I want to do is I want to take you to chapter 14 of Mark and look a little bit more in depth, in depth at what is taking place just prior to verse 66. So would you open up there for a moment, please? Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. I want to look at this for just a moment. You see, a decision is being made concerning what to do with Jesus Christ. It's recorded in chapter 14 of Mark, in chapter 14, verses 55 through 65. Let me read that to you, and then we're going to look at this for a moment and develop a context, and then we'll go on back to verse 66 of chapter 22, the Gospel of Luke. But here in Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 55, Mark says, The chief priests and all the, the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, to beat him, and to say to him, prophesy. The officers struck him with the palms of their hands. And so you see that Luke was actually giving to us an abbreviated version of what was taking place as is recorded by Mark in chapter 14. So Jesus has been taken before the council. This is the Jewish high council. It's also called the Sanhedrin. It's the ruling council, the religious council. It's made up of high priests, the high priests and chief priests. It's made up of the elders and scribes in the nation of Israel. 
And, and what they're doing is they're, they're seeking a charge against the Lord Jesus Christ. It says that they sought a charge against him. What they're trying to do is they're trying to get testimony so they can formulate what would be called a capital charge. They want to find something that they can accuse him of in order that he might be put to death. Now, it's illegal what they're doing. Notice in verse 55 here in chapter 14 of Mark how it says the council sought testimony. That was an illegal act. They were not supposed to be seeking out testimony. And uh, the reason they're doing that is because they're trying to formulate a charge against him. And so as they're seeking out people, what happens is there's a whole a group of people who come and bring false witness. That's what it says in verse 56. Many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. You see, in order for Jesus to be able to be put to death, according to the Jewish law, there needed to be at least two witnesses whose testimony Agreed. That would be according to the Old Testament laws given to the nation of Israel by, by Moses. In Deuteronomy in chapter 17, it says at verse 6, on the testimony of two or three witnesses, a man shall be put to death. No one shall be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. And so they're trying to get more than one testimony so they can formulate a capital charge against the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, people are standing up and they're making false witness against him. But the people who are making these, these charges are actually misquoting Jesus Christ. Notice how it says in verse 58, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I'll build another made without hands. And so what they're doing is they're misquoting the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember at the beginning of Jesus' ministry how it, it's recorded in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, how Jesus was there in the temple, and he said, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And so what they're doing is they're formulating false charges against him. They're misquoting something that Jesus has said for their own gain, even as continues to this day, as we know. People will use the words of Jesus, twist them out of context to attempt to formulate a charge against those who follow him. One of the brothers in the fellowship recently sent me, a, sent me a link to an article found in Newsweek magazine where an individual was quoting Jesus, hoping to use the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus to shame Christians who were in opposition, or rather, I'm sorry, to shame Christians who were in favor of Proposition 8, those who were in favor of the passage here in California of the, uh, you know, the amendment to the Constitution declaring that those who get married and are to be male and female, well, they were using, she was using the name of Jesus and his words, twisting them out of context in order to try and formulate a charge against those who follow him, a charge that we do not love people and we're very filled with hate because we oppose uh, homosexual marriage. It happens to this day. It continues to this day to take the words of Jesus Christ out of context in order to formulate charges against not only him but those who follow him. Jesus obviously had been speaking of his physical resurrection, but what they're doing today is the same as what they did then. They're taking his words out of context in order that they make a charge against him, and that's what was taking place here when it says there that uh, they had quote him as, quoted him as saying, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. That's one of the reasons why, by the way, it's important for us to be familiar with the words of Jesus Christ, because we encounter people who misquote him all the time, all the time. All you need to do is read, uh, read uh, letters to the editor, even here in, in the newspaper, a daily newspaper that we have here in, uh, in, in our area, and, and you'll see people misquoting Jesus all the time. I've had conversations more than once, obviously, uh, over the years. I've had many conversations with people who will misquote the Scriptures. That's why it's a, good re it's a good thing to know the Word of God so that you can say, no, that's not what He said. Remember, Satan himself misquotes Scripture. When Jesus was there being tempted by Satan, it's recorded in both Luke chapter 4 as well as Matthew chapter 4, uh, Satan told Jesus to cast himself from the pinnacle of the temple. He said, for it is written, uh, he shall give the angels charge concerning you, and, and they shall lift you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. 
Satan himself takes the scriptures out of context and he, and he misquotes them. And, and uh, because the scripture says, uh, it, it says, uh, he will give his angels charge concerning thee uh, to keep thee in all thy ways. It, what that scripture is talking about is not presuming on the grace of God, but walking according to his ways. But Satan took out a portion of that scripture in order that he might try to tempt Jesus to jump from the pinnacle of the temple. And so the enemy has misquoted Scripture and, and maligned Scripture from the very beginning. That's one of the reasons, one of the great reasons for us as believers to be familiar with what Scripture has to say in order that when somebody misquotes Scripture, we're able to, to say that's not what it says, this is what it says, and to point them to the passage that they're speaking about and to correctly interpret it. And so that's what they're doing. They're taking the words of Christ and they're twisting them. But notice it says in verse uh, 59, but, but not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? And so the high priest is, is frustrated. The, this is Caiaphas. And, and the testimonies are inconsistent, and it's closing in on, on dawn, and people will soon be in the streets, and he wants to end this farce of a trial quickly. And so he's trying to get the Lord Jesus to speak. But notice verse 61, he kept silent and, and answered nothing. And, and so what is taking place more than likely is Caiaphas is speaking to Jesus, but Jesus is just looking into the eyes of Caiaphas. And as he's looking into the eyes of Caiaphas, it must have unnerved him. Can you imagine God himself looking directly into your eyes, how unnerving that would be? That would be incredibly unnerving. When I was a young pastor, uh, I was talking to my own pastor, Chuck Smith. I was 30, 31 years old at the time, just two weeks ago. No, it was, it was a while ago now. And I remember as I was speaking to, to Pastor Chuck that he was, you know, he looks right into your eyes when you're speaking to him. And I started getting this weird feeling that, that he could read my mind. It was really a, an ugly feeling. So I started thinking holy thoughts, you know. I said, oh, God is good. You know, it was just an odd, it's kind of an odd feeling when you're speaking to just an ordinary person that you respect. But how much more when you're, when you're, when you're looking into the eyes of Jesus Christ and, and when Caiaphas is speaking to him in the way that he is, it must have unnerved him because Jesus was not responding. Jesus was just looking at him. And as Jesus is looking at him, uh, there had to have been some kind of thing going on in the heart of Caiaphas. His own heart is being revealed. You see, Jesus is innocent. For him to answer false charges is unnecessary. Sometimes silence is the best method of dealing with lies. Sometimes it's just the best, best way to deal with it. Psalm 26, verse 4, beautiful psalm, says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him. There are times when it's just wiser not to respond at all when somebody is, 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 is interrogating, trying to find some fault. Sometimes it's better just to remain silent. Jesus remained silent. He didn't have to answer. He was innocent. And so as he's looking at him and looking into his eyes, he unnerves him. Job 34, 21 reads that God's eyes are on the ways of man, and he sees all his steps. Psalm 90, verse 8 says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your countenance. And so as he's looking at him and looking into his eyes, it must be unnerving him as he's seeing and reading him. Now, as Jesus is there remaining silent, he's actually fulfilling Scripture. I, I mentioned to you that Isaiah writes a lot concerning Messiah. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 7 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter 
And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And so as the Lord Jesus is there remaining silent, he's fulfilling a prophecy that related to him that was written 700 plus years before by Isaiah. And so as this is taking place, notice verse 61. Again, the high priest asked him, he said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now, this question is illegal. Jesus was not obligated to respond because this is called self-incrimination. He didn't have to respond. If he did, he could incriminate himself by his own words. But notice with me that he does respond. He responds to the question, verse 62. Jesus said, I am. And so he responds and he answers him. He goes on to say, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So he's saying, yes, I am. I am the Son of God. When he says you see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power, he's saying, I am the Son of God, and I am also the judge and king of the whole earth. What he's saying to him, and this is what's really powerful, is Jesus is saying to him, you stand in judgment of me now, but I will stand in judgment of you later. When he speaks of himself in that way, he says of, of himself that he's the Son of Man. If you take notes, that's found in Daniel, in the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel had said, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So Jesus was actually saying, by referring to himself as the Son of Man, he is calling himself Messiah. Because the Jews knew that Daniel 7.13 was in reference to the Messiah. Jesus in Matthew 25, 31 and 32 said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The Lord Jesus Christ is the, is the Lord and the judge of all. Those today who find it so convenient and so easy to, to mock him and, and to speak of him in the way that they do, will not be feeling so comfortable when they stand before him as their judge. And instead of us in any way feeling good, I'm looking forward to that when they stand before him and they go through the fear, we ought to be really concerned for their soul and the, and the concern ought to be causing us to want to share with them if given opportunity about how good God really is because ultimately they are going to stand before God in judgment. I, I can still remember some, some young um, people who were saying, well, you know, um, yeah, I want to go to hell. There's no big deal about that. If I go to hell, all my friends are going to be there and we can party for eternity. And, and they have this attitude that is so light and, and all, and they don't realize what they're really saying. They don't understand what they're really saying. And they're saying that they want to stand before the judge of the whole earth. Jesus Christ is the one who's going to stand there and he's going to make the judgment. If people receive him now, he welcomes them into his kingdom. If they reject him now, then he sends them to their everlasting doom and their everlasting judgment. He's going to be the one who does that. He separates the sheep from the goats. Those who are called sheep are those who are followers of Christ. Those who are goats are recognized as being those who did not follow him. And so Jesus is saying, yes, I am the judge. I'm the one who's going to be making the judgment ultimately. So you are standing there now, or sitting, sit, sitting there now, making judgment on me, but I will later be the one who makes judgment on you. Well, that got them, really, got them really upset. Notice verse 63, the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him to be deserving of death. And so as he's speaking here, he tears his clothes. The, the tearing of the clothes is normally a, a, a sign of mourning. It's a sign of grief or indignation. And what happens is Caiaphas is pretending to be outraged. 
In reality, he had designed to put Jesus to death, but he's pretending at this point to be outraged. And, and he says in verse 64, you've heard the blasphemy. That word blasphemy, as he's speaking about it, he regards Jesus as being blasphemous because Jesus is making himself equal to God. And so as he does so, the answer is unanimous. This is a man who deserves to die. So what do they do? Verse 65, they begin to spit on him, blindfold him, and beat him. As I'd mentioned to you earlier, spitting on someone's face is the greatest insult. It's the deepest contempt being shown. Job in chapter 30, verse 10 said, They abhor me. They keep far from me. They do not hesitate to spit in my face. It's one of those things that when someone was, was, had his face spat upon, that was a sign of incredible contempt. This is part of what Jesus had to endure. Now, when it says the officers struck him with the palms of their hand, somebody that I was using as a commentator as I was preparing my study wrote this. It said, this face was the face that used to break into a smile at the approach of a child. It had been in the habit of beaming graciously upon publicans who became penitents. It could glow with righteous indignation when the Father's house was being desecrated. Above all, it was the face that mirrored the heart of the Heavenly Father in all His holiness, displeasure with sin, and last but not least, love and tenderness. It was into this face that these men were spitting, and it was this face that they slapped. And that's what's taking place. They're mocking him. They're abusing him. They're using their palm to hammer him. They're spitting on him. And all because he loved him. Because he had done nothing to deserve that. He had just spoken to them a message they didn't want to receive. He spoke to them a message related to forgiveness of sin. He spoke to them a message concerning a relationship with God. He spoke to them a message about having a new life. He spoke to them a message that, that, that gave to them hope for the future. But as he spoke that message, he also brought about the fact that, that their hypocrisy was something worthy of judgment and, and their lack of love for people as well as the lack of love for God was going to end up in, in eternal, eternal judgment. And, and they didn't want to hear that the way the world doesn't want to hear that same message today. And as a result of that, rather than listening to this one who spoke such incredible words, such gracious words, such eloquent words, such powerful words, such life-changing and freeing words, they responded with anger. And when given opportunity, they, they hammered him. And when given opportunity, they, they spit on him. And they did that to him at the end of the night. Now, turning on back to Luke chapter 22 and picking up, in verse 66, Luke 22, verse 66, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, if you're the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe, and if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we've heard it ourselves from his own mouth. See, originally what we were looking at in Mark was outlining what would be called a preliminary hearing. This is a formal hearing. It's now morning. And the council is going to pass their final resolution. They've already decided that he must die, but this second meeting is going to ratify their decision. You see, in Jewish law, when the death penalty was being considered, the defendant had to have two trials. Normally, there was an interval of at least one day. That was required. But they had Jesus in custody, and they didn't want to risk an uprising of the people. A second thing is trials were not to take place at night. But they had a trial at night, and now they're giving him a second trial without a day's inter interval, and so what they're doing is breaking two of their own laws as they're rushing to judgment. 
By holding this second trial, though, they're going to retain a picture of legality. Now, in verse 67, when they say, if you're the Christ, tell us, they didn't give him the exact same question that they had asked earlier. Remember, we read this. It was found in Mark 14, 61. Earlier, they had said, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? The question is asked so they can confirm their earlier decision to put him to death. But Jesus' response in verse 67 is, is he says, I t if I tell you, you will by no means believe. Now, this is what's interesting and important to see what's taking place here. This is the dynamic that's taking place. When they say in verse 67, if you are the Christ, tell us, you need to know that during that time, and I've mentioned this to you already as we've gone through Luke's gospel, during that time for them, the Messiah was not what Jesus actually turned out to be. They had a different idea of what Messiah was to be. The Jews during the time of Christ, the religious leadership, a large group of them, believed that Messiah was to be a political king. They believed that the Messiah who was to come was going to actually be like a government official. And so they weren't thinking in terms of Jesus Christ being the Son of God. What they were looking at is they were looking at someone who was going to come to be like a king, who was going to deliver them and set up an earthly kingdom. They did not have a picture of what was called the suffering servant. Jesus didn't fit into their expectation. They didn't understand what Isaiah had spoken of in Isaiah 53. They didn't understand that passage. What they believed was when Messiah came, he would immediately crush their foes under his feet. They were under Roman persecution and, uh, and oppression at that time, occupation. They hated this, and so they thought when Messiah was going to come, Messiah was going to liberate them in a political sense. So Jesus didn't meet the bill. Jesus didn't come in the way that they thought that the Messiah was to be. He wasn't a political king at all. He was a suffering servant. And so they're asking this question of him because they're, they're trying to see whether he speaks of himself in the same terms that they understand. And so when they asked him, are you the Christ? Notice Jesus didn't answer yes. That's because of their incorrect assumption regarding who and what Messiah was. They didn't say, are you the son of the blessed? Because they expected a political Messiah. This is why Jesus says to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. Now, he already said, I am the son of the blessed. But they did not want to believe that he was the son of God. Turn with me for a moment to John's gospel, chapter 5. I want to show you something there. John chapter 5. Verses 17 and 18. They had this idea that Messiah was going to be a political reigning king. They didn't expect him to come in the way that he did. They didn't expect him to be God in the flesh. As you're turning to John's gospel, when I was in Israel on one of my earlier trips there, we had a, an Orthodox Jewish guide at the time, and, and he and I had gotten to know each other because we had used his, um, him, him as a guide on several occasions, and and, and eventually, he became comfortable with us. Uh, when you go to Israel, guys, and, and you, you meet the guides for the first time, if they don't know you, they, they have a tendency of being pretty closed, and as they should. They, they don't give you their opinions. They don't share much with you at all. They, they'll take you to the sites, and, and, uh, and they'll basically give you the history of the site. And then what they'll do is they'll, they'll step away, and they'll say, the pastor wants to share something here or whomever is going to share. And so what will happen at that point is I or one of the guys will walk up and say, well, this is Caesarea Philippi, and we'll give a Bible study. You see this in Matthew 16. We'll speak about it and give a Bible study. We'll go to Capernaum, and, and the guide will say, this city was established at this time here. This is how old it is. This is the place that, that uh, the Apostle Peter's home was discovered. And they'll say a variety of things like that. And then they'll say, and pastor here probably has a few things he'd like to share here in the side of Capernaum. And he'll do that through the whole trip, and you're together with them for 12 days. You're with them every day. You get up early, you stay with them late, and you get to know them. So at the end of uh, almost two weeks with them, sometimes they get used to you. Now, if you use the same guide over and over again, you actually begin to have a real friendly relationship with them. They get to know you. You'll, you'll show up to Israel. They'll meet you at the airport. They'll walk up to you when they see you, and they'll give you a big hug, and they'll say, uh, shalom, you know, welcome home. And, and, and you become real, it's just real friendly. Well, this fellow was real friendly with us. We'd used his services several times, and we had gotten to know him and all. 
uh, as, as a guide and also in personal conversation. And so on one occasion, he and I were having a talk, and, and normally they will not speak to you concerning their religious beliefs, and he being an Orthodox Jew would normally keep his beliefs to himself, but he became comfortable with me. And on one occasion, we were at a particular place having a cup of coffee together, and he looks at me and he says, do you know why, why um, Orthodox Jews do not believe that Jesus Christ is Messiah? And uh, I said, why is that? He said, because you believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, don't you? Well, yes. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word dwelt amongst us. We beheld His glory, the, only begot the glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Absolutely. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is a fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. That's what the New Testament teaches, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And so I said, yes, of course. He'd heard us teach. He'd heard me teach numerous times, sharing that. And so he says, we don't believe that. He says, do you know why we don't believe that? And I said, no, I'd like to know why you don't believe that. He says, we don't believe that because we believe that God would not take upon himself human flesh. We believe that that would violate his own commandment which states that there should not be an image of anything from heaven and therefore God would not violate his own commands. He said also, we are not looking for God in the flesh. We are looking for a political savior who will come like unto Moses. He's like Moses who will deliver us. What he's looking for as an Orthodox Jew falls right into what the New Testament says the nation of Israel will be deceived into believing. He's looking for a man who is going to bring peace to the earth. And the New Testament says that man is Antichrist, who's going to be bringing a false peace. We're going to be, we're going to be looking at that, by the way, this upcoming Sunday who will bring a false peace. And as I was there talking to him, it just, I just, it just hit me so hard. It hit me right between the eyes. I said, oh, my goodness. Exactly what the Scripture says is what this man believes. But what he believes is not new. What he believes was believed 2,000 years ago. And that's what's going on here. They're saying, are you the Christ? What they're saying is, are you the political deliverer? Are you claiming to be that? And so Jesus, in his response, had already spoken earlier and said, I am the son of the blessed. I am Messiah. But they do not want to see him as being God in the flesh. They reject that testimony. But in John, you're wondering if we're going to look at this, huh? John chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Jesus said, uh, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. They could not embrace that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. They could not embrace that. Later on in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, Jesus is speaking there, and in John 10, 32 and 33, he says, Many good works I've shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. That is what got Jesus put on a cross. The fact that he was making a claim that they would not embrace. They would not believe. Notice back in Luke chapter 22, when they said in verse 67, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. They would not entrust themselves to him because they would not believe who he was. There are people who want to have a relationship with God on their own terms. 
They want to tell God how much of what he says they're willing to embrace and believe. God doesn't bargain like that. You embrace all that he says, not just certain segments that make you feel comfortable or that you can intellectually fathom. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is to be embraced. And so as he's speaking to them, he's saying, listen, when I speak to you what, and say to you what I am, you have no desire to believe the things that I'm saying. So he says in verse 68, and, and if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. And so as he's speaking to them, he's saying, if I give you an answer the way that needs to be given, I'm going to have to give you an entire Bible study so that you can once again hear the claims that I am making, so that you can once again understand. You see, later on in, in the Gospel of Luke, it's recorded in chapter 24, Jesus is on, on the road to a, a small village called Emmaus, and as he's on this particular road, he's encountering two disciples, and, and he speaks to them. It's found in Luke 20, 24, verses 44 and 45, and, and as he's speaking to them, he says, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scripture. Scriptures. The Lord is walking with them and begins to open up the Word of God. He, he opens up the law, opens up the prophets, opens up the Psalms, and he starts pointing to the Scriptures that related to him. If he was to once again do that with these, they, he'd need to give them an entire Bible study. But, but the, how many times do they have to hear the same thing? How many times does a person have to hear the same message? There are times when, when I've had conversations with people. It doesn't happen often. But there have been times when I've had conversations with people who are really not interested in what's being said. They'll ask questions. They'll even want to debate. They want to make their points. And, uh, and I, I, I won't argue with, I have no desire to argue with, with them anyway. I mean, that's not something I plan on doing and don't like to do. I don't like debating. And so... There are times when you can see that they have a sincere interest, and so they'll say, but what about this? And, and, and it's sincere. And you can share with them. There have been times when I've talked to people and they'll ask a question, and, and I have said to them, I, I, do you really want an answer, or are you just wanting to argue? No, I really want an answer. You really want an answer to that question? It's going to take a moment. Yeah, I really want an answer. Okay, will you, will, you, will you agree with me that you won't interrupt me until I give you the answer? Because a lot of times what happens is the minute you begin to give the answer, some of you know this, the minute you begin to give the answer, they interrupt you. They want to jump in and they want to say, but what about? But what about? Because they're really not interested in the answer. And so what I ask for is permission. I ask for permission to continue giving them the answer until it's fully given. And if they interrupt me, then at that point I'll say, you obviously aren't really interested in the answer. And so what's the point in conversing? What's the point in conversation? What's the point in discussing? I'm not going to argue with you. And so, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, excuse me, I've just got so many questions. And, and I'll say, you know, I understand that. But if you allow me to answer the one that you're asking, then we can move to a second. Can we do that? Now, there are times, for example, some of you know this. I'll just give a common example. All of you probably have spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses before. Jehovah's Witnesses are trained to, to answer questions with questions. Have you discovered that? If you say, well, John 1 says this, they'll say, but what about? And so I, I learned that very early, and so that's kind of how I learned to discuss things with them. I would say, are you going to allow me to finish giving you the answer to the question you just asked? Well, you know, I'm just more interested in this. No, if we're going to have a discussion, let me finish answering, and then we'll move into the second question. But if you're not interested in the first answer, why should we proceed to a second question? When Jesus is there speaking to them, they have no interest. You can pick it up immediately. When they have no interest, why waste your time? Jesus said it on, on one occasion like this. He said, do not cast your pearls before swine. There are times when people are really not interested. They don't want to hear it, and that's what's going on here. He says in verse 68, if I also ask you, you'll by no means answer me or let me go. You're not really interested in the question. You're, you're, you're really not wanting an answer. 
Now, there were times when they would do that. They would just say something, but they really didn't want to hear. But he goes on to say this in verse uh, 69. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Well, as he says that, he knows that they're going to condemn him to death. So he made sure that they knew exactly what he was saying. What he is saying is, he will soon be seated at God's right hand. When he says that, that's a picture of being in power and authority. The psalmist in Psalm 110 verse 1 says it this way, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus was very clearly saying, I am Messiah. I am seated at the right hand. I am in power and I am in authority. And so that's what gets them upset in verse 70. They said, are you then the son of God? He said to them, you rightly say that I am. And they said, what further testimony do we need? We've heard it ourselves from his own mouth. We don't need another word. What he has just said is sufficient to condemn him. We're going to bring a charge against him, and it's a charge of blasphemy. You see, in Leviticus 24, 16, it says, Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. And so what happens is they take this as a capital charge. They already had heard it earlier. This is the second time they've heard it. That's all they need to hear in order to formulate this charge. And what they do is they bring it to the Roman governor, a man by the name of Pontius Pilate. And as they come before Pontius Pilate, they speak to him. It's recorded in John 19, verse 7. And it says there that they said to him, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. They understood him clearly and completely. One of the things that I try to have a practice of, especially when I'm given the opportunity to share one-on-one, -on -one, is I try to make a practice of giving enough information to be crystal clear concerning what Jesus Christ said and man's necessary response to that. That's the heart of all teaching, is to try to be as clear as you can about what's being said and to encourage a response to that, to respond. If Jesus Christ is Lord, if Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the more I know, the more I'm responsible for if I hear the claims of Christ and I turn a deaf ear to it and reject it, as I stand before God on judgment day, I give an account of that rejection. And what I want to do is I want to make it so crystal clear that when you hear what God's Word has to say, you have a response, an obligation to either believe or reject, but you have an obligation to be accountable to that which you already know. And so when the Word of God is preached and somebody is seated there hardening their heart, then ultimately when they stand before God, they have a great amount to be accountable for, a great amount. And so I really believe it important for us to hear and to obey and to respond the first time that God actually makes it very clear to us. These people did not want to hear what Jesus had to say. All they were looking for was an accusation that they could lodge against him. I've had people in this church, by the way, numerous times, numerous, numerous times, not just here, but in places I've gone in radio rallies and things, who have come not to hear, but to argue. And they get so angry sometimes I mean, there was a period where, where people were getting so angry, and, and I, I thought, oh, boy, how slamming doors. I mean, they'd get up and they would slam doors. I was teaching at a particular church one time, and, and I, I used to speak there fairly regularly for uh, the, the senior pastor when he was on vacation or, or whatever, and, and, and it had happened like two or three times in a row where people got up, and I can still remember standing up, and they introduced me, Pastor Dave from so-and-so, and, -so and and I stood up there and said, okay, listen. I remember I introduced like this, listen, I'm going to get you mad today. <laughs> I said, but do me a favor. Please, don't stand up and walk out and slam the door behind you. I said, it's really just so rude. Please don't do that. 
If you don't agree, then, you know, take it to the Lord. But show some courtesy. You know, I mean, if your dad was talking to you and he's saying, I've got something important for you, would you get up and just walk out in the middle of his sentence? You know, for me, I was raised in a home. When my dad spoke, everybody listened, including my mom, especially my mom. We all listened. This is the truth. Even when my dad was, you know, 71 years old and I was, you know, whatever age I was at that time, when my dad would speak and I was his pastor as well as his son, to his deathbed, when my dad spoke, I closed my mouth. I was one of those sons that if dad's speaking, I'm listening because I was taught to respect my father. I was taught to do that, and I did till the day he died. I would listen to him, and when dad would be in the room and the kids were there as adults when all of us were in the room and daddy would speak, then we would listen. That's just the way it is. Or when I've gone to school, I'm in college class, and the professor is speaking, I'm, I wasn't one of those who would be handing notes to the person next to me. I wasn't one of those who would be talking during his lecture because I, I thought that he had something that was important for me to know because, after all, I went to that class and I was paying for it. I ought to receive the things that he has to say. So I wasn't one who would, in the middle of a lecture, just close my book, get up and walk out. That's not true in the church today, though, is it? When somebody gets as fed up as they're going to get, they just get up and they walk out. And so I was bringing that up to this particular church, and I said, listen, I'm probably going to say some things that you don't agree with. Please don't get up and slam the door. Listen to it and think about it. So I thought, well, surely that'll make an impact. About halfway into it, guy gets up, closes his Bible, walks to the side. I still remember it to this day. It was to my right. Walked up to the metal doors. There were metal doors. And opens it and slams the door. And I thought, my, my, my. How impressed I am with his immaturity. How impressed I am with his rudeness. I mean, it amazes me. But you know, that took place probably 18 years ago and it's worse now than it's ever been, where people just can't listen. They don't want to listen. And maybe it's because what's being said hits them where they live. So you have two responses. Either you say, busted, you got me, Jesus, or you fight it. But you know what? Your arms are too short to box with God. There's no way you can win that fight. So the wisest thing that we ought to do, I would think, is to embrace what he says. Blesses your life and changes everything when you agree with him.